Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics with a really, really fun tutorial today. Um, I'm so happy that Pine Mountain Designs designed a series of patterns around pink cushions. And I actually found these quite some time back and made this pink cushion and use this today in my home uh, sewing studio. And I thought, you know, who doesn't love a pin cushion to just doll up your sewing room. We use them all the time. Um, they can be pretty and functional. So uh, Sandra Workman has graciously allowed uh, me to show you how to make this amazing uh, pin cushion. Big and practical. You're seeing an image of it here. I love that we can incorporate some hand embroidery and some patchwork to have such a practical and again, adorable addition to our sewing room. So let's get started. You can see on the table, there's a lot of things here. I'm just gonna talk to you about them as we go. Now you can certainly be using your own fabric, just pick up the pattern and do that. Or our kit will include these beautiful Bell Isle fabrics. This is from Minnick and Simpson. This is a Moda collection. One of my favorite patriotic collections of the year. I just think it's just very classic um, and went really well with Sandra's pattern. So how we're gonna be running our kit is we have picked out our DMC embroidery floss and that's an add-on because I know you might have a drawer full of embroidery floss and don't need that, but maybe you don't or maybe it's, it's old and you kind of just like, I don't even wanna deal with that. You just wanna pick up that embroidery floss. So that'd be an add-on for you. But in your kit, of course, we'll include the pattern all of the Belle Isle fabrics that you'll need uh, to do that, as well as your button and your rickrack. That'll be included in your kit. Really affordable on that. And of course, you're gonna wanna have that nice and sturdy pin cushion. We have Plum Easy's, both the unscented and my favorite, that lavender scented, which is amazing. Our lavender buds in there with lavender oil from France. It's amazing smelling, I love it. Um, so we'll be talking more about that uh, but let's just start off with the first thing that we do to kind of set up the project is we're going to make a pinwheel that's going to be looking just like this. So let's just start with that of like, maybe, maybe uh, you know, pinwheels aren't your thing, or maybe it's been a long time. So the first, first thing that our pattern will be having us do is cut four of our colored fabrics here to five inches and for our white fabric, same, cutting those to five inches. And so I just have those right here. And we're gonna make one of these together. I'm gonna to show you a really cool technique that has incredibly increased the accuracy of my half square triangles, which is what you create, this is a half square triangle, what you create to make a pinwheel. So a technique that I learned, and probably the way you learned, is I take my lightest fabric, and we draw a line from corner to corner. This is the historical way, and I'm gonna get my iron heating up. I'm gonna show you the historical way we do it, and then I'm gonna show you the really cool way I, re I very recently kind of discovered by just almost like a mistake. So the way that we have, probably you and I have both learned how to make half square triangles, is to simply draw that line from corner to corner, and you'll place that right side together with your colored fabric. And you, may, you might decide to pin that. And in this instance, you're sewing, according to her pattern, a quarter inch away from one, one of the, the, the line. Left or right doesn't matter. So in her pattern, she just had you sewing on the one side because you're only doing one half square triangle. Here, here's something that I realized though. You could sew on both sides of that you're gonna cut on the line and you essentially would be able to make two of these. In this instance, we only need one of those. So we're only gonna sew on either the left or the right. It really doesn't matter. So this is the way that, in fact, let me just go, let me just go show this to you. You draw the line and then you sew a quarter of an inch away from the line. Let me just do that real quick. And I have to be careful to find that quarter of an inch consistently to have all of my half square triangles come out the right size and I need to, to make my pinwheel work. Oh, 
Okay, and then simply uh, cut on that draw line. And as we often do, we simply press to the outside. In, the, in my uh, preparation for this video, I was looking for a straight edge and I actually had a corner clipper um, uh, from Creative Grid and I just grabbed it. It just happened to be handy. And I'm going to trim off these little dog ears here. And I thought, you know, that's, I'm just going to use it for the straight edge. Um, but then I realized something about that, that tool in that moment. And I want to show it to you. It was like the, like the light bulb turned on for me about just how amazing this is. So let's start this again. This time I've got my white fabric. Let's just grab our, our uh, let's see, which color am I going to be making with you today? I think the one I'm going to be making is actually this one. Let's just, let's just do that. Let me see that. I know the ones I made. Yes, this is the one. All right. Cool technique. All right. On the back side of the fabric, let's see, I was always, this one is hard to tell. <laughs> Those white on white, you have to be very careful. What side is the right side? What's, that's the wrong side. Check this out. I hope that overhead camera can capture this. This is a corner clipper. Remember I said we're cutting these to five inches. This tool is five inches. I swear this tool was made for this project. Check this out. When I lay this tool on this square, notice how that line already goes corner to corner. What I realized is when I just draw this line, all I got to do is sew on that line. I don't have to find a quarter of an inch away from the corner to corner line. I just sew on this line. That's extraordinary because I am way more accurate sewing on a line than a quarter of an inch away from a line. So I thought this was an amazing discovery about that tool that I wanted to share with you. And now you can even use the, the same tool if you ch would choose to. It kind of doesn't necessarily reach that corner to corner. I'm just going to grab another straight edge here and just cut corner to corner. And again, add this to your stash. If you're inclined to make two of these, you would just draw that line on the other side. So I, I love when you've figure out that a tool has yet another job to do. It becomes more valuable to me when a job has more than one function. Okay, we're going to press to our dark again. Trim off these little flaps. Just like that. And Let's just clean up. I'm going to try to kind of clean up as I go. We know we have our beautiful embroidery floss that's coming. So yeah, every time that I, I make a, a pinwheel, I'm like, I better lay this thing out because I've sewn them in the wrong orientation so many times. I've just learned just lay it out every single time and make sure we're in the proper orientation. So once you have your pinwheel laid out, remember how we press to the dark every single time? And I'm going to actually repress this one. I want a good press there. Once we lay these uh, right side together, do you see how we have our interlocking seams? So we're going to just stack that, pin this here and here. And so our quarter of an inch right down this side. Here, we want this point to come together. We'll stack them right side together. But I want to start sewing here. So I'm going to flip this over. Right side together. Pin. Okay. Now I've got a lot more to be covering with you. So quarter of an inch quarter of an inch and as you can see back here we press these seams open all right 
once you, you know let me just go sew those i'll do that real quick off camera so these have been sewn the quarter of an inch and pressed open again just lay that out make sure you have the proper orientation this is a block but not the block we're making right <laughs> now lay those right side together of course we're wanting to hit that point right there and you can see from that overhead if you kind of have your fabrics vertically you can see that a little bit better we'll start pinning in that point because that's what matters to us both uh, the most and then we'll pin over here less important than hitting that point right there in the middle let's go sew a quarter of an inch again we'll do this together So let's warm up that seam. I wasn't going to put, uh, sew that whole thing together with you, and I thought, you know, maybe this is the first pinwheel you've ever made ever. <laughs> let's just show you how to do it and show you how it is really very easy to do with some good practices. Once you have everything pressed out really well, you're going to want to be getting some source of a light. Now I'm going to be using the Wafer One light box. Um, I love that in the old days, uh, <laughs> I simply could not afford, I was raising some little ones, um, I couldn't afford that. So, hey, if that's you, or maybe you live in a really sunny location, you can certainly have tape up your diagram, maybe on a sliding glass door, and then try to position your fabric over that it can be very challenging and awkward as you're trying to, you know, uh, basically tra trace around the embroidery design. I find my pen, the ink rolls back on me. So I am just, uh, thank goodness, I've invested in a light box. I love it, it's more convenient. And I don't have to rely on a sunny day to be able to trace an embroidery design. So the wafer um, daylight makes the wafer light, uh, light boxes. There's one, two, and three. One's the smallest. I love that they have the on and off switch that if you hold it down, it gets brighter, 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 brighter to its brightest setting. Many light boxes are just off or on. And I appreciate that they have these varying settings depending on your comfort level. Obviously measurements around there if you should need that. So going inside the pattern, um, for our American Pie pin cushion, we have our diagram, and notice it has these grids in that, and that's to sync up with, of course, the quadrants on our uh, our. I guess you'd call that our pinwheel unit at this point. So I'm trying to position. You see the lines here sync up with the lines here. Do you see that? It might be easier for you to see if I have the light off. I'm trying to get that footprint to fit right over top of that. When I believe that's where I want to be, I'm just gonna adjust that just a little bit. You're just gonna hold steady. Now I'm using a friction pen, and the reason I have that is because if I make a mistake, I simply iron it away. If you have a permanent marker or a micron pen, just know it's permanent. Um, you'll, if you make any mistakes, you're either going to live with that or maybe that's where you can use that leftover fabric we talked about to make another pinwheel top and you could try again. So that's a nice reason to be very economical with the fabric that's in your kit and you do have enough to make two, uh, at least of the colored portions. And you could just grab another white uh, if you need to. So let's look at this now. We're just going to draw in those lines and just carry on this way until our design is in there. Lightbox just makes it so easy. So you're going to trace everything down. Once that's done, let me move that off to the side, the instructions inside the pattern 
will guide us into what color is being used. Now, please note that the colors that Sandra used are, I, I did mine just a little bit different, the DMC floss, um, because I'm using different fabric than she uh, did. Some of the colors are the same, some of them are different, but they're very easy to understand. My gold is a little bit more of a vintage gold, but it still says gold. My brown's a little bit of a deeper brown, but it still says brown, very easy to understand. Most of the time she's using two strands, sometimes she's using one, just be uh, sure to include or refer to the pattern um, of how many um, she's recommending. And of course, it's just a guide. If you want a denser um, stitching, use more strands. She also has her embroidery stitches mentioned here, and she has a diagram. She does a really nice job with her pattern. Blanket stitch, the back stitch, the stem fly, and the French knot. If you want some additional resources, we won't be covering the stitching in this tutorial because it's already very long. You can be sure to pick up the Embroidery Crazy Quilt book and maybe even pick something different altogether. And you can very much customize that. So let's just study the embroidery that I did. And I want to call attention to something else that I thought was really fun. She has us add some uh, batting to the back of this before we start stitching. It just gives the quilt top more girth and strength as we're using it, but it gives it this kind of quilted look. It was just really a joy to actually use this. Now, as far as attaching the uh, piece of batting, this is just warm and natural. You know, once you have everything um, drawn on, I, would, I used to hoop the whole time. So I didn't feel the need to either run a basting stitch around this, around the perimeter to hold them together or maybe use a basting spray because I was always in the hoop stitching this. If you want to use a basting spray or some other way to attach this to this, by all means, you could certainly do that. This is where I very much recommend a hoop. I use the seven inch hoop on mine. Um, we have the seven inch hoop available by itself. You could pick that up. Or if you're doing a variety of projects and you're doing some smaller ones as well, we do have the set of three. Pick whatever that is that's right for you. And this is where you can now bring the project into uh, the hoop here. The easiest way to put the hoop in, maybe this is the first time you've done hand embroidery, is to put the ring on the top. And I just try to center that initially and flip it over and then in you squeeze these and you're just going to press in and you want this to be nice and taut one thing i want to tell you and i've learned this the hard way it's you if you stop embroidering and of course it's unlikely you're going to do this all in one setting unhoop the project take that out otherwise this ring this memory will stay in there and it's very difficult to press away. So I do want to mention that. And this is just so handy. Everything's nice and taut and you can just enjoy the process of the hand embroidery. Now, one thing I want to call your attention to is you notice these kind of the, the seams. I love that she has an extra detail of stitching along those seams. And do you notice how I just went out as far as I thought um, I needed to go and I made that assessment based on the embroidery template. We haven't gotten to that point yet, knowing that in the end, in fact, let me just bring it to you now and I'll show you how I, I made my template. In the end, this is what's going to happen here and I'm going to cut all of that away and everything out here is going to be discarded. So there's no reason to bring your stitching your, of your seams, these extra details, all the way out to the end. It's just a waste of time, unless you just want to do that for practice. You can see I stopped short of that, so I did want to mention that. But let me unhoop my project. Sometimes if you have a hoop, uh, if you're lucky enough, you never have to adjust the hoop. I did have to adjust that a couple of times out in here. And again, you're going to kind of just now bias this in the corner. It's no longer centered because I couldn't have achieved that. I just unhoop, bias toward the corner, flip it over, and then I rehoop that. So that's how that works. So this is where we are right now, and I just briefly touched on this shape here. 
and there's there's two shapes that you're going to want to make a template because you don't want to cut your pattern. Notice on the other side of that is your diagramming. So I don't like to cut patterns. I always like to have my templates. Hey, we already know that we need to have um, some form of a way to uh, have illumination so that we could transfer our embroidery diagram. So once again, I'm going to bring this out. And my favorite product for making templates is absolutely the Cut Right Heavy Duty Freezer Paper. It's my go-to for every template <laughs> I ever make. It's so thick, it's incredible. And I love that I can use it again and again and again. If I do decide to iron it down, it's never permanent. It's not like it's a heat and bond. It's not a fusible product. You can put it down, lift it up, and you could do that 10, 12 times if you want to iron it down. We don't need to iron this down. We're just trying to make a shape to trace around. So in the pattern, you have the embroidery template, but you also have something called the base, and that's going to be the bottom of our pin cushion. And that's this one here, the base template. So you're going to make this template. I have both my base and my embroidery. Go ahead and label those. But the easiest way to do this is, again, we're going to head back to our uh, light box. And isn't that lovely to just have that on there? And of course, you're going to trace that around as best you can and cut that out. And note, right? Take note of where those are. And you can maybe draw some lines there. And of course, you'll use a straight edge to be able to go back and make them just perfect. So you're just gonna make your template for both the embroidery and the base. All right, and remember I mentioned that um, Sandra did more than one of these pin cushions. There's uh, this one happens to be the patriotic version. She has other ones. They're coming your way. I'm, I'm working on those right now to hand embroider them. So when you make these templates, you'll use them again. So I, I love that whenever I can use a product twice. Okay, so we have those templates. This is the time now, and we're gonna make this together in real time. But I've got all of that done. I've got all the hand embroidery done. And this is where the grid that we've drawn, look how nice that's lining up with our seams. So let's just make sure we're exactly where we wanna be. And if your lines are extending through to your seams, you know you're in the right location. Now we will trace around that. I love that the freezer paper is a really sturdy edge that it's not gonna collapse because I'm pushing against that edge right now. I wanna get a very nice circular uh, shape drawn here. There we are. See how that stitching extended just a little bit beyond? And that one, it looks like, came up a little bit short. But by the time I add my rickrack and my seam allowance, you're barely going to notice that. But let's say that you're like, nope, I want that stitching running all the way to the edge. Just add the stitching. Add some more right here and just to complete that. Now you'll go either cut that out, you know, if you're comfortable with the rotary cutter by all means. I'm like, you know what? I spent a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of time doing the hand embroidery. Um, I embroidered this one myself. And so you can either use the rotary cutter. These are my Karen K. Buckley scissors and we're just gonna cut everything out. Okay. This is reality quilting, reality creating, right? All real time. Um, I love that she added this cute little rickrack detail. Um, you don't have to do that if you didn't want to do that. Maybe you're making, uh, maybe you're picking up the pattern doing that from home. I think it's a really sweet touch, very Americana looking. So let's grab that rickrack here. And the rickrack is, I, I practice this a couple different ways and I want to give you kind of the feedback that I learned along the way of making this. We've got our top and the rickrack is going to be sewn to the top of this, keeping in mind that our backing is going to go on top of this thing, right? A circle and the circle is on top. 
So when we turn this through, this is basically going to roll over like that. I want you to keep that in mind that you're not biasing the rickrack out there. You're biasing it in inward so that when that is sewn, this rolls to the outside. Here's what I found to be challenging. Because of the valleys of the rickrack, and I know I want to bias it here, and I'm trying to run just a basting stitch, and that ultimately when the backing is placed on top of that, I'm sewing with a quarter of an inch seam allowance. That tells me I need to be less than a quarter of a seam allowance now to put my basting stitch on. And I'm like, how do I do that with these valleys that are deeper than a quarter of an inch? So I kind of sat there in that sewing room for a while contemplating, what's the easiest way to explain that? Because having this out here is, is awkward too, because we don't want that, that edge turning into the pin cushion. Here's what I found. When I realized the goal here was to have as much of the rick rack showing out here and have an edge that where everything is caught in my basting stitch, I realized by trimming my rick rack on one side, this is just a suggestion by the way, made it easier for me. Let me show you what that is. You might want to try that if you have some extra rick rack, see if you like this technique. If you don't, just know that you'll have to have that rick rack kind of pushing over the edge and you just kind of accept that, right? And we're just going to clip that in place. That's option one. In fact, let me just show you that. Sometimes when I discover a technique, I'm like, hmm, some people might not like that. Some people though might prefer it. And that's why I like to mention it to you. So if you don't want to trim your rick rack, and knowing we want to bias as much on toward the middle as we can, but we want to be able to catch every edge of this rickrack and not have any gaps that are missed. That's very important that we achieve that. You're just going to use our mini clips. When I tried to use the full wonder clips, they're too big. They, they interfere with this gap. And I was trimming very, very frequently, just like that, all the way around. And at one point I realized it was almost easier to do it from this side because it's easier to see the interval back here. So that's another thing I kind of discovered along the way is it's a little bit easier to see it back here. So that's another possibility. If you decide to sew on this side and I recommend it, because I can see this edge the whole time. I know exactly where I am. I would flip those wonder clips over because they have a flat surface on the bottom to ride right along your machine. And this is meant to be for the top. So that's something else I wanted to throw out to you. Here's what I'm going to do because I really liked having a very straight edge available to me. I went in with my uh, ruler and I trimmed away. I, 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 I'm now looking at this line trying to establish the same amount of this peak, seeing the same amount of the peak and I trimmed it away. You can't do a whole big stretch at a time. You kind of have to work your way down. And you're basically trying to, let me show you what this did for me. Now, do you see this? How it fits right along the edge? I'm much more comfortable with what I'm seeing because it's echoing my edge and it actually has a little more stretch. There's more, a little more give because now I have a little bit of bias. Now, Rick Rack will fray. So you want to be careful. If you do take this approach, don't handle it too much. Here, I would probably sew from this side. So let's just, I would be clipping it like this, right? And we're gonna come in. So I'm gonna finish trimming my Rick Rack all the way down. And then when I come back, we're gonna start uh, 
pinning that all the way around. And I'm going to show you the technique I kind of came up with because the end of Rick Rack phrase too, how do we manage that part? We'll definitely talk about that as well. But let me go ahead and get this trimmed up all the way down. So my Rick Rack is all trimmed and it's, you know, once you, if you take this approach again, is just an idea, just an idea, you know, find your place. I want to see, maybe see if I can capture this on the overhead. This is the four and a half by eight and a half inch creative grid. And see this dash quarter inch line that we use for quilting all along. I was running this in that valley. Do you see that valley right there and how that dash line? So if you kind of hit that spot every time, you're going to have the same interval. It's just an idea to try to have a reference point so that you're it's very even where you you know maybe you want to start where it's red maybe that will be a less obvious place because there's going to be an overlap we talked about that i'm going to try to clean off that edge as best i can and have a nice fresh edge so as we lay this part out i might even kind of leave this open because that's a that's a little bit variable to me right now. That, that part, we know that when we flip this thing over, that's a raw edge right there. And that as this thing travels around here, that's going to potentially be underneath or over top. Let's just leave that part open for now. And we're going to start clipping. This is, like I said, where the wonder clips come into play. And I'm going to sew from this side. So I'm going to have the clear side on the bottom and the pretty side on the top and just every valley every one i've got i'm going to have a, a clip in there when i did this basting stitch you know sometimes we think of basting stitches long stitches that you're going to pull out you're not pulling this out i had actually a very short stitch in there and i was short of the quarter inch of course because I'm going to come back later when I add the, the backing on top of this and sew the full quarter. So you need to make sure you're less than that quarter. And I shortened that stitch length. I, I wanted to stabilize um, this Rick Rock and not have that going anywhere potentially. So I know basting stitch, people start lengthening. I, I didn't do that. In fact, I shortened it. So I'm just going to keep clipping. We're going to have a clip all the way around. Let's just kind of come back um, you know what? Let me do this. Let me clip it and we're going to come to this ending together and let's talk about that we'll, again throughout some options. It's not really kind of talked about in the pattern. It's just kind of like sew the rick rack to the top and, and we need to find our way. And these are just some ideas. So let me get this clipped and I will meet you over here where those two ends meet up. And we can talk about some ideas of how do we deal with this ring edge of rick rack? What are some thoughts um, that we could think about? So I'm at this place where I'm like, how do I end this thing? Remember what we said about that edge is going to roll over. In fact, let me just take that out and just kind of show you that that's the part that we're concerned about that it's going to show. So while it feels natural to tuck this under here, you don't want to do that because remember when this is now rolled this way, that's the raw edge. So you're going to roll this back. This is just an idea of how to deal with that raw edge. Do you see how I'm rolling this back so that it's a footprint of itself? It's, a, it's mimicking that. I don't want to roll it back here. I want to roll it back until that shape repeats just like this. So I'm going to repin that spot. I, I've, I've considered this two, th two ways, and I'll, I might as well throw them out to you. You can think about this. Maybe you don't want to do it like that. One other idea that I had had when making um, this the first time is once you lay this out and you figure out where this is going to live, where this needs to lay down, let me just clip this, and you figure out where this one needs to, to, to lay, there's a, there's a confluence. And once you determine that, you could potentially put a crease here, put a crease here, 
pull that out and sew that with a red thread. And now you've got that. So that's one idea. I'm gonna go with this idea today. Let me unpin some of that. Of rolling this back onto itself. Just like that. And that's probably more than I need. In fact, I'll trim some of that away. I don't need all of that. Maybe just a little bit like that. Okay. Let's let's clip that one well. Here, again, I'm just going to go trying try not to overlap that rickrack. That's a lot of bulk right there. So we're trying, we're trying to have them kind of meet, but not overlap. It's too much. There's too much going on. Clip that, have that fold back onto itself just a bit right there, right there. I really wanted the echo of the, the rhythm, I would say, of that rickrack to have that perfect uh, sine wave all along. But where it begins and where it ends, you can't help that. So the circumference is what it is. <laughs> um, and so, I don't know if we can, no amount of manipulating is gonna see how those two, I just want them to have that perfect little wave. There's no amount of, of changing this left or right will actually alter that. So we're just gonna do our best to try to have as smooth of a transition there as we can. But hey, the top of our pincushion is so pretty that we, we hope that people aren't looking too closely at this this little joining that needs to happen at the very, very end of this project. I'm gonna scoot that in just a little bit snugger. And we can always trim away stuff later if we feel that we need to. Okay, that's our tender spot. I'm gonna start probably pretty soon. I wanna, I definitely wanna capture that. This is again where I've got a shortened stitch length. I don't want anything moving, especially what's going on here. Some people like to use a little bit of fray check. Um, you could do that as well. I'd certainly do that out and away from the embroidery project. It can be messy. Um, let's, let's get going. I've got a red thread loaded in the machine now. You don't necessarily have to have a red thread, even if you're using the red rickrack. I just thought it, it was an if. If I'm gonna see any of my stitches, I want it to at least match my rickrack, right? Okay, I have less than a quarter of an inch seam allowance. I'm just kind of riding on the inside here of this presser foot right now. I don't know if you can see that. And let's get started. We got it. There we go. Notice I'm just, where I'm sewing is just enough to catch that scoop right there, but not much more, just enough. And so slowly. Okay, I definitely want to trim that extra little flap away of our beginning and end so we can see that, how we're doing with that. 
Let's do that with this one too. Yeah, I could see almost overlapping them. You know, I thought I thought we talked about that, and I don't I don't think I necessarily love that. I could see undoing this side and, and maybe laying that over there just so that there's not a gap right there. I don't think I like that. In fact, I'm going to fix that. Let me grab a seam ripper. I don't, I don't like what I'm seeing right now. Oh, you got to see. Look at that. I got a seam ripper on stage and I'm going to use that or on the set. Imagine that. <laughs> if you watched any of our videos or my videos, this is the reality of it, right? Especially when there's something that's it's nothing we normally do. How do we manage that? What's the best technique? Eh, you give it a try. I don't like what I'm seeing. I don't like there's a little gap. I tried to butt them up and there's just a little bit of a separation that is bothering me. So I'm going to seam rip that and I'm going to lay that over the top. Hey, I'm going to use this pin cushion. I want it to be exactly how I want it to look. That's why Clover makes great seam rippers. They're meant to be used whenever they need to be used. All right. So I'm going to be a lot more comfortable putting that down. Let's get a nice clean edge again. Let's do our best to, to clean that off and maybe just not touch it very much. And if I had fray check with me, I'd absolutely be putting just a touch of that on there. Um, if you've had a struggle with fray check getting messy, you might want to try that with a Q-tip. And again, I keep it far away and it's flammable. Be careful about using that near any heat source. Let me go through this again. And we're going to continue on once I get this sewn down. Wow, I've got a lot of wonder clips over here. I am so glad there's a lot of these that come in a package. Okay. So we'll definitely start a little before our clip, reestablish ourselves. We're going to go over this several times. All right, I feel a lot better about that. And I can see that's just going to, it's just going to look better. That confluence here, we can certainly mess with later on. And by the time this rolls back, everything's going to be just fine. Now the backing, this is another area I want to talk you through. We have our embroidery template. We used that. Remember, we had our embroidery and we laid that out. We made our circle, cut everything out. That's how we're here. Notice the base template is smaller. I'm going to give you an option on this. But if you just follow the pattern, of course, you make your base template also from another sheet of the freezer paper, the light box. You've got that perfectly cut out. And you're just going to have this on your uh, backing fabric. Draw around, cut around with a rotary cutter and scissors, and here you are. If you choose this option, how the uh, pattern is guiding you through this is to basically, um, you're going, notice this grid. You're going to be um, drawing that grid on your base. And how you would certainly be doing that is you're just going to be laying this down and lifting that up and marking in these quadrants. In fact, I'll just do that real quick. Just like this. How this project works and how the pattern is going to guide you, I'm going to give you a pointer on this one. How the pattern is written is those points, this this and this. So this needs to line up here. And then this point lines up here. The base is smaller than the, the uh, embroidery template, this part. So we're doing something called easing in. How somehow we have to make something smaller 
but something bigger. How do we do that? I'm going to show you that. But I'm also going to give you an option about this backing because the way the pattern is written, while you get all of this pinned in and you kind of ease all this in, the way it's currently written is you're going to cut, just cut a slit in the back, turn the project through that slit, fill it with the crushed walnut shells, and then whip stitch that closed. Um, I've done that technique before, and, and of course that's a raw edge, and it, and it made the closing of that a little more challenging because it had frayed a little bit as I turned the project through. I was filling that with crushed walnut shells, and it made it a little bit challenging for me to close that because it was a raw edge. I'm going to give you a pointer, and you have enough fabric in your kit to do that. If you're going to be doing this from home, on the back of the pattern, we're having you cut a base that's seven by seven. If you're going to take this approach, I'm going to give you, you want to start off with a piece of fabric that is instead an eight by eight. You'll just simply take your uh, Creative Grid ruler or whatever you're going to uh, use, and I'm going to lay this on here and just simply cut this in half, exactly in half, for two uh, pieces that are four by eight. So all I'm going to do to start off with, let me get my iron heating up. This is just an option, and what the option's going to do for you, in fact, let me just show you where we're going. This is where we're going. This is going to give us a slot or a slit in the back to fill our pin cushion with our walnut shells, but that it has, it doesn't have a rod edge. It has a turned edge there which will make it a lot easier for us to close this in the end. So this is just an option not included in this uh, pattern. So that's why you're watching the video. All right, you have your two halves, and this is where I want you to grab for, uh, you know, a hot ruler. It's my favorite clover. You can't, you can't hurt this thing. I can't use an acrylic ruler with a hot iron, or I'm certainly not going to have, I'm going to have a melted acrylic ruler. I just folded that edge over. See that quarter inch, the half inch? This goes all the way up to two and a half. I laid this on here and laid that edge over a half an inch to that line. And actually, you know what? You don't even need to necessarily turn that edge under. Sometimes it's easier. Let me give you a note. But I'm full of options today. I just want you guys to be successful, giving you choices and you can choose. Let's say you do choose to turn both of those edges under by um, that quarter of an inch. Let me just give you that option real quick. Once that edge is established, you do the same with the other one real quick. Okay, I'm going to give you the option if you don't have the hot ruler. Maybe you don't have one on hand. That's fine. You can either just turn the edge under or I've got the two pieces here. Just draw a line. Just draw a line that's a half of an inch. And we want to, this is eight inches long. Um, and my ruler is eight and a half. I'm just going to make that be the eight. And I'm just going to draw here toward the middle. And I'm going to leave about a two inch opening. See that? Simply place these fabrics right side together and you're sewing. Make sure you backstitch this juncture right here, right there. You don't need to worry about backstitching this because it's going to be cut away. But you do want to backstitch this because that is the opening. I'm going to show you mine. You see that backstitch there and that backstitch there? This is the opening that we're going to be using to fill in with our, our walnut shells and eventually closing that. So you don't have a hot ruler. That's fine. And, and there's you can just draw that probably even easier than using the hot ruler. So let me just put that aside for now. So that 
that would be kind of an optional notion. But again, just reinforce. Once you have that, I want to show you that I did not press the seam open. I pushed them off to one side. You'll see why that's going to be helpful to you in later on securing our uh, backing. I'm going to take this route. I could, I could take this, but I'm going to do the same step. I'm just going to come in with my base template, now trying to make sure that my slit is in the middle. I think I can probably just eyeball that. It's probably easier to see it actually from my drawn line from the back. That's about my middle right there. Let's just draw that and cut it. And we can go back once we have it cut out. I am feeling confident. I'm going to use my rotary cutter for this one. <laughs> and we can uh, mark those quadrants. That's very important. OK. Those lines, very important. Let's mark those again. We definitely want that. Because that's going to help us make sure that when we're easing in, we're easing in the, 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 even, the same amount in each one of these wedges. Okay, we don't need to mark this because we have our wedges there. We can see what we're trying to get accomplished here. So what I'd recommend is clip your places, clip your marks first. Don't try to ease in along the way. I'm going to clip here, I'm going to clip here. This mark needs to go to that seam. All right, we can see that seam. We know we've got that one. Looks kind of weird right now. <laughs> so how are we doing? How do we do this? Remember, this has a bias edge now. This is not going to have a lot of stre uh, stretch at all. In fact, at all. We've sewn the Rick Rack, and Rick Rack has just no stretch to it, which is good for us right now. But we know this does. I do this action. Do you see from the overhead camera what that does? I am I'm creating a, a stress on this here. And again, you now kind of we've marked our this. You might want to start in the middle right there. Clip that. and then go clip these two spots. So this is a lot of clips. Again, the, the mini wonder clips are the uh, MVP, <laughs> I would say. Definitely the most valuable uh, player of this video. Um, I like to often use the, the regular size clips, but they were just, they didn't fit in the valleys of the Rick Rack very well. And these were definitely a, a better option in this instance. So again, let me show you this one more time. We're going to pull that. See that stretch happening? Let's get that middle. Just like that. Like Bethany says, be the boss of your fabrics. That's what I'm doing. And I'm going to keep clipping. Lots of clips happening. Lots of clips. So I'm going to keep doing that. Then the next, I'm going to be uh, joining you at the sewing machine. And we'll be sewing a quarter of an inch seam allowance very slowly. I'd recommend a much shortened stitch length. We don't want any of this coming apart at this point. So I'll keep clipping and I'll see you there shortly. 
here we are. Wow, I think, uh, like I said, MVP. Okay, I'm just going to hold, I got, I've got to have a place to begin here where my clips aren't interfering with anything. And here we go. I'm going to shorten that stitch length even more here. And that clip I can see is in the way. Let's remove that one real quick. Okay. Here we go. We made it guys I had to go pretty slow there <laughs> easing in isn't something I do a lot of this look like you're like what is that well that's what it's supposed to look like so far let's push that through the opening you can see you know with the the batting that we're using it's a it's bulky and that's why I really liked having that turn edge opening option if you do choose the uh, one layer where you just cut the slit, what I recommend, I don't think I elaborated on that enough. Um, if you do take that option that's noted in the pattern, before you try to ease everything in, just cut that slit beforehand. Because once you have that eased in and tucked in, you're trying to cut that slit with your scissors and it's never gonna be straight. If you're going to take that approach as noted in the pattern, make that slit then go ahead and do all the clipping and all of the all of the sewing but we chose this route and again be sure to um, if you're doing that with your own fabric from home maybe you're picking up the pattern you just cut your fabrics to the eight by eight cut that in half to a four by eight and turn that edge under okay let's see how we're looking Pretty cute here. I'm going to grab for my point turner. Boy, I think I think we're done finally with those <laughs> wonder clips. They were very helpful today. So point turner, we've got that point for points, curves for curves. I'm turning out a curve. So let's go ahead and do that now. Get it all nice and smooth. I don't think we need to, I'm going to iron that, I try to iron that. I think by the time we fill that good and, and full of our, uh, with our walnut shells, that's going to get any wrinkles out of the way. But you know what? I just want to be on the safe side. I want to get it all nice. We, we've spent a lot of effort doing all of this embroidery, right? We want it to be all nice and smooth. So kind of just iron that out. If you've got a funnel on dollar store items, let me just clean up a touch here. Um, great time to grab that. We touched on it just a bit. The, my favorite walnut shells are definitely plum easy. I know they go through a special process. They're cosmetic grade. Um, they've gone through an extra baking process, so they're pure. Um, and of course, I love that lavender. It's amazing. So I'm going to go with the lavender today. Um, I brought both. Um, so maybe you don't like that scent. Um, be sure to just pick up the unscented there. Probably one bag will be enough. And we're just going to start filling that up. It might be a little bit messy. So, you know, sometimes if you have a baking tray, um, might be an idea over a trash can. We're just going to fill that up and then I want to show you um, how to close it and then we're going to put the button on the top. I wish you could smell this. Can you see the lavender um, in there? Those little, maybe you can see them from the overhead. 
I just love that. And that's a farm I know um, that we get these from, and as well as lavender oil out of France to add just even more of an amazing scent. And I'll keep filling this up, and then I'll get it as full as can be. And when I come back, um, I'm going to show you how to close that. We'll get that part done. And then we'll move on to how do we now put a button on the top of this thing? Uh, we'll, we'll cover that as well. And then a pin cushion will be done. So I did put the entire package in there. And we know we're going to, to kind of, you see this kind of depression in the middle? And they stacked two buttons. We just have a single button going into ours. But the first thing we need to do is close that. Now, if you want it even fuller, you might consider a second package, but we are going to compress this thing, which will create this little depression. So I'm satisfied with the one package. Richard Hemming needles, clover embroidery needles, whatever you have just stitched that project with, you'll go ahead and grab a blue thread if you're using the kit or whatever you're using from home if you're using your own fabrics. I chose a really long length and I've got two this is the same strand. Notice the loop right here. I don't know if you can see that. That's a loop and the two ends. The why I'm doing that is I really don't want to have a knot to start off with. I, am, I want to be able to come into this. And let me do this first. Remember that flap I talked about, how I wanted to press it all to one side? Now, I'm going to bring that edge over here to cover that up, and this is going to go right on top of that. See how that's just one more layer, because we, we don't want these walnut shells coming out in time. See how that flap tucked under? This fold's going to go on top, and I'm going to use my longer these are the, this is the extra fine pens from Clover, and these are the fine. They have a greater uh, thickness in the, the um, pin portion here, and they're longer. They're perfect for this mission right now. I just want to kind of have that held closed while I'm stitching it. There we go. All right. What I'm talking about with this threaded needle, with it having the same, not two strands, one very long, and you bring both ends up and thread your needle, is that allows this, this scoop right there. See that? I am going to come in here. And I'm going to go right through that. Far more secure than any knot you're ever going to tie. It's a great way um, to actually also get into cross stitch. You could have a much longer piece of embroidery floss, bring that strand up, um, both ends, thread your needle, and now you've got basically, it's as, if, it's as if you were using two strands of embroidery floss, and now you have the scoop to go through. It's a much more secure way to, to kind of get into a project. And now we just whip stitch this closed and remove the pins along the way. Now we know at the very end, of course, there will be a knot. But let me just, I want to show you that as well. I am going to keep whip stitching this closed. When I, I'll uh, meet me over here on the very end, and I'm going to show you a couple ideas of how to tie off and bury this, the end of this thread way deep in your uh, pin cushion. So I'll keep stitching, and I'll see you almost uh, right before we tie off. So we keep having this loop here, right? I'm going to start to go underneath that loop. I'm starting to form some security at the end of this. You can keep knotting three, four times through those little places. And 
one more time. We're going to use this pin cushion. We want this thing to hold together. <laughs> okay, now that we're here, I don't want to just clip this because that's going to have that thread right there. I'm going to go deeper into this. Now be careful you don't lose your pin. <laughs> I've done that. I've done all the things as they say. Make sure you see it coming out. Grab a hold of that. I'm going to pull it. Let go. Now my thread is buried somewhere deep inside and very, very secure. And that's what I'm looking for. Okay. We said we've got this button. How are we going to do this button thing? Um, most of my needles aren't long enough to go from the back to the front and capture that button. Um, sometimes you have a dial needle on hand. Um, I know we were going to be ordering in some longer needles. I think they may be even, I can't remember what brand they were. Uh, maybe even be Bone from France. Um, so that may be an option for you. You just want to get something that's got uh, some length and you want to get a thicker, this is a pearl cotton, um, lovely, obviously coordinates um, very nicely with our red button. And we will thread that needle. And we're going to end up starting at the bottom of the project. Coming up, whoop, you know what? Let me just clip that fresh and try that again. How about I thread the needle and then tell you how we're gonna do this. No need to knot. We're going to end up coming in the back and we're going to tie. I'm looking for the center of this. And I'm going to be coming up through, knowing where our holes of that are. My first instinct is to come right up through the, through the middle. But I'm just trying to come up through the eye of that button. And you can see the, by, the eye. Eh about there and I'm going to be putting my button in there. This is that depression, that kind of place. So when we were worried about our pin cushion not being completely filled, this is what allows that depression to happen. It's that kind of sweet curvature um, that is very, very sweet. Now we're not going to pull all the way. We're going to leave this back here. Our goal is to go back down through. Now, if you are concerned about security of this and you want to go back down um, you want to go back up through again, by all means, you can certainly do that. This is really thick. This is the, um, boy, this color is stunning here. I think this is, this is a razzle dazzle. I don't, don't think the colors, our color could be 1148. So if you're going to pick picking up the, this would be a, a beautiful addition. I feel very satisfied. I, I cannot imagine this breaking. It's very, very thick. Heck, I might as well leave that doubled up like that. Let's look and see what we've got. We really, we really do have that doubled up like that. Or I could pull that thread through. There we go. So that's, that's what we have right there. Now I'm just going to go ahead and put that a little bit less to deal with. So let's, let's make sure we're as tight as we want to be. Just like this. If you go over and over again, that helps lock something in. It doesn't kind of back out on you. It helps keep it there to allow you to go around and around once again. I mean, it's so, you could put a tiny little button even on the back side. Super cute. I'm going to tie this again and one more time. And there we have our American Pie pincushion. 
How cute is this? And I love that it, it's got a lot of real estate. I can pin my long pins. I mean, I could fit all of these. My one at home, <laughs> you can barely see the embroidery because I have so many pins in it from, from so many years. I think it's just adorable. And obviously now it smells nice in my sewing room with, with my uh, lavender scented um, walnut shells. So um, form and function, I love that when we can do that. Goodness knows that accurate quilt blocks start with really good piecing. And if we can have a really beautiful um, pin cushion to just put a smile on our, fa our face. I think that's really fun in our sewing room. So I know this has been a longer tutorial, but you know what? I never want to leave any stone unturned or have you go, how'd she do that? I want to always take you through all of it so you can know with absolute certainty that you can uh, be sure to make one for yourself. So hey, share this with a friend. More tutorials coming your way, of course, always working on new projects. I'll see you soon on another shabby video.